Hello, welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aigul Satyulina and I'm a community catalyst at the Do Asia. So the Do is an impact innovation advisory from Germany. We're helping companies to be more purposeful and having offices in Berlin, New York and Hong Kong. We have uh, multiple initiatives in everything related to ESGs and um, we'll soon get into that topic. So uh, we, are, um, we have initiatives in climate action uh, called Race to Zero. Uh, we work also with UN. Um, uh, one of the uh, initiatives that got recently quite famous is Count Us In, uh, aiming to inspire 1 billion people to significantly reduce their carbon pollution and um, We've been recently uh, having partnerships uh, with uh, uh, Netflix as Don't Look Up and the, the most recent one, um, as you've pro probably uh, heard about, about our great national parks, uh, movies on Netflix. And here in Hong Kong, um, we have an initiative uh, together with uh, Club Wheelock, uh, which is called W Lab. Um, helping uh, with a mission to co-create a happier and healthier Hong Kong. So if you'd like to know more, please uh, get in touch uh, later on. And I'm really excited to uh, have uh, today uh, with me uh, three amazing experts and uh, specialists in ESG. ESG is a hot button topic and we've been receiving so many requests to you know, have uh, to organize a, a webinar to really understand in depth what it is, um, not only um, as a trend, but actually how to get started, right? Because quite often we hear so much, we read so much, but then we don't know how to get started. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Francesco Stadler, um, who is an Associate Director at Sustainable Finance Initiative um, here in Hong Kong. And he will be today our conversation lead. Um, so welcome, Francesco, and over to you. Sure, thanks so much, Aigo. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me today and for organizing this, uh, the do. Um, I think it's great. Um, as you mentioned, I'm currently an associate director of the Sustainable Finance Initiative here in Hong Kong, uh, which in, in a nutshell is a, a uh, network of family offices across Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, uh, and Singapore. Um, uh, of family offices that are committed to deploying um, capital towards sustainable investing. Um, maybe a couple of words about me. I started off uh, in private banking initially, uh, but realized quite soon that uh, I was more interested in, in sustainable finance, which is what I've been doing now for over five years. Um, I first worked for an impact investor um, in, in, in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, I worked on microfinance, sustainable agriculture, energy, uh, mainly focusing on private debt and uh, public-private partnerships. And then after moving to Hong Kong, I joined Sustainable Finance Initiative, uh, where I'm more focusing on uh, venture capital, venture, uh, venture investments, uh, mainly in the impact space. Um, before jumping into the questions, I would like to uh, first introduce our, our great speakers today, uh, uh, Kylem and Victoria. So uh, maybe starting with Kylem, uh, if you could give us uh, a quick intro about yourself uh, before we uh, we go on to uh, Victoria as well. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kylem and thanks Francesco for the intro and to Agu from the Do. Uh, I think some of you know me and um, I and some of you know me from my professional background and also from my nonprofit background. So professionally, my background is in real estate investment and asset management, and I've been working through my professional role on sustainability, more or less on the side, and when opportunities arise. But very recently, I've actually had the pleasure to move to Link REITs, which is a real estate investment trust in Hong Kong, and leading their sustainability function. So the team there is mature, so it's a real privilege for me to join them. And in this new role, I've been able to leverage my experience on the business side, my understanding of the departments and also how we work with internal and external stakeholders so that I can work with them to implement ESG further across the business. Um, on the NGO side, I've been working for the last 10 plus years in grassroots nonprofit work, very different. And I founded Ecomarine, an NGO focused on marine debris and also Exchange and Empower that I co-founded with a Nepalese athlete, 
to support and empower women from disadvantaged backgrounds through trail sports. So um, I'm excited today to share a little bit about what I know and also what I don't know about ESG implementation at the very small scale, personal scale, and also at the larger corporate scale. So I think both, I, I don't know if everyone agrees, but I think both levels is very important and also personally rewarding. Great, thanks so much, Kaylin, for the for the great introduction. And uh, and uh, maybe now Victoria uh, can can also give a couple of words about herself. Sure. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar names uh, among the attendees. It's uh, it's awesome. The community in Hong Kong is really amazing. And thank you, uh, I will Brinda and Bedu for organizing this. Um, my name is Victoria. I work in climate and sustainability risk advisory practice at uh, Deloitte, and we help companies uh, implement uh, sustainability, right? Uh, a lot of projects that I've been working on lately, they revolve around uh, carbon, so uh, calculating carbon footprint, uh, putting forward a carbon pledge, um, and internal carbon pricing, a lot of exciting stuff is happening, but my background is in broader sustainability. I used to be an ESG ratings analyst where uh, we're, uh, you know, scoring who is good and who is bad in terms of their uh, uh, sustainability performance. And the reason my journey towards sustainability, um, I think I was very fortunate to kind of early on understand that I, I I do want to kind of make an impact as much as possible with my career. And my, uh, I am, uh, my training, I, I'm trained as an engineer. And uh, early on, I worked for oil and gas uh, industry as a consultant, where I, I was exposed uh, to the, you know, the impact the footprint that the industry is uh, leaving on, on the planet. And then uh, this is, and, and that was, uh, a while ago, that was back when people had no idea what ESG is and, and when I decided that I want to move towards uh, uh, sustainability professionally, uh, nobody, my parents were shocked, nobody really knew, you know, what it is. They thought that I was going to be like an environmentalist, which was almost a curse word back then. But I'm so happy that right now everybody, you know, is, is in tune. Everybody knows what this is and there's so much interest. So it's a good opportunity to learn uh, from you, learn with you. And, and share what I know. Great, thanks so much, Victoria. It's great to have uh, such amazing speakers like Caleb and Victoria today. So I'm really looking forward to learning more uh, from both of you. Um, just before jumping to the questions, uh, can I remind you all to use the uh, Q and A function in the in the webinar? So anytime you you want to park a question there, um, we're gonna do um, three questions first. Uh, you know, like a round of questions among us, the the speakers, and then we're gonna tackle some of your questions as well from the audience. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's jump into the questions, I think. Um, I think the first one um, I would like to ask Kalem, actually. So we've been hearing a lot about, you know, um, ESG for, for, for some years now, uh, but the topic seems to have picked up uh, much more than before um, um, recently. So I was wondering whether you can, uh, you can help us understand what's, what's really behind uh, the, you know, the ESG trend and why it is not too late to, uh, to implement it in, uh, in an organization. Uh, sure, I'd be really happy to. So I think there are many problems in the world right now. I mean, global population is continuing to grow and we're already exceeding or at least testing nature's boundaries. So environmental issues such as climate change that Victoria talked about, resource depletion, uh, loss of biodiversity, these have all changed from scientists' warnings to very real and current risks. So at the same time, we're also facing huge inequality between and within countries, and there's a pressing need to raise the living standards of those without access to very basic things that we take for granted. Um, all these inequalities also creating a lot of tension within communities as well. So whereas these were things that sort of like do-gooders or environmentalists uh, were talking about for a long time ago, these trends are now very observable in real terms and affecting everyone, individuals as well as organizations. I mean, personally, I think it's not really a question of whether it's too late to implement it for an organization. Um, we all need to play a part in creating a more sustainable and fair world, and it's not too late to start. Great, thanks so much. 
Uh, it's very very insightful to hear that. And uh, I don't know, Victoria, if you if you have anything to add uh, on what Kalen said already, or yeah, uh, Kalen, I really appreciate you touching on the S in the ESG on the just transition. This part of the conversation very often and it, it you know it's left uh, outside of the room and, and it's it's great you know that we kind of open with this. Um, I've been reflecting on this question and um, I think that unfortunately from a lot of corporate uh, corporations organizations um, at this point the conversation is still is it too early to, to start you know on your ESG journey unfortunately and uh, a lot of the biggest driver is uh, regulatory compliance for for companies right and um, I'm really excited that we see Hong Kong actually being on the forefront of uh, putting forward these requirements, the HKMA requirements to comply with the task force, um, TCFD for financial disclosures, uh, the SFC requirements, you know, the list goes on, but at the same time, there are also more and more regulations um, coming out of, for example, uh, Japan is considering implementing regulation on uh, human rights in supply chains, right, the social elements, and this is all uh, great, this will push companies to, to start on the ESG journey. So it's definitely not too late. <laughs> um, and, you know, I hope that more companies will, will think that it's time, you know, the time is now. Uh, and I will focus on, on this driver, but this conversation is, is so broad, right? It's, it's the main driver should be because we want to have a livable planet. But for the businesses, you know, uh, the regulatory compliance, uh, access to capital, so getting the money from the investors, these are still the biggest drivers that, that, that make businesses start on the ESG journey. I would like to say, like, on the other hand, the customers and the investors and also high net worth individuals, the second generation that are coming to power now have uh, very different values and increasingly they find ESG very important. I, I'm hoping maybe Francesco can share more given his work with the um, high net worth families. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, I, I definitely agree. Um, for, for me, uh, I wanted to tackle first the parts uh, where, where, we, where we were asking whether it's too late, you know, uh, to implement this. I really think, you know, um, in general, ESG risks or uh, ESG in general, it's, it's a very crucial uh, component in any organization because of the materiality of, uh, of ESG risks, right? So I really think that there is no, there is no way that this can be too late because you're really addressing, um, you're really addressing a crucial, uh, crucial risk in a company, and, uh, um, and and you need to mitigate it in order to uh, you know make the company uh, more sustainable for longer. So I think for sure, um, the the let's say the timing uh, the timing is now. Uh, that's that's for sure uh, correct. And uh, I mean, in terms of uh, ESG becoming a trend more and more, uh, I think Asia is slightly behind the rest of the world, uh, but uh, we're catching up quickly. Uh, we see more and more next gen, as you mentioned, uh, in Asia. Uh, above all, lately in, in Southeast Asia, actually, uh, looking to, into the topic, being very interested uh, in the space. And, uh, you know, this comes from uh, maybe uh, a willingness to, you know, uh, do business more holistically. So taking so social uh, aspects and environmental aspects into consideration as well. But also, um, I think it comes from, um, you know, the heavy marketing that financial institutions have been doing on, on ESG as of late, I think. Somehow, even though it's uh, it's greenwashing, I think it helped uh, kind of like mainstreaming this uh, this topic. So something good came out of it, I think. Um, great. If you if you don't have anything else to add on this question, so I, I think the second uh, the second one that I wanted to tackle is uh, um, probably um, more for for Victoria, given her background. Um, and then, and then Kaylin can provide some more context as well. But I was, I was wondering, like, uh, in terms of the ESG ratings, if you could help us to actually, you know, define ESG ratings. And uh, I think um, this is a controversial point, but why are they, are they not um, nice to have anymore, let's say, uh, the ESG ratings? Why are they not nice to have anymore? Uh, yes, thank you for this question. And there, there is a lot of negativity around ESG ratings 
So the uh, we are we are all very passionate about the uh, you know sustainability and and uh, climate and and making a positive impact. Uh, but and I'm at the same time you know I I I consider myself uh, a pragmatic person around this. And and at this point ESG ratings, although by far not perfect, this this is not the perfect solution to you know assessing companies' performance. But it's the best that we have at this point, simply put, right? For, for example, if you're an investor and you need to allocate, uh, you know, your, your capital, how would you go about, uh, you know, evaluating hundreds and thousands of companies in your portfolio? Uh, how would you make, you know, exclusions or, or uh, provide preferential, perhaps, uh, uh, conditions to companies that are driving sustainability forward? So ESG ratings, you know, it's the best we have. And uh, I think I think I'll uh, shape my answer in two directions. So one is for larger uh, corporations, right? For big organizations. And here we see a lot of um, conversations. A lot of clients they come to us and they say that we see this demand from our investors, right? In the next, or even from our business partners. So if we want to continue being a business partner uh, with this organization, who is a leader in sustainability, then we need to perform. To a certain standard, um, you know, according to a certain ESG rating. So for these companies, they they have to do this if they want to continue uh, being com uh, competitive in the marketplace. For smaller companies, and this is there's a big uh, conversation around how can small and medium enterprises stay competitive in this market that is tightening the requirements and expectations, raising the bar on ESG, right? So here my um, I, I, I used to work for a company where small and SMEs were the, the biggest part of, of the companies I evaluated. And um, it's, you don't have to, it's, you know, it's very, it's common sense that a small organization cannot possibly compete in terms of resources. And then also in terms of, you know, the scale of the actions with the large organizations, but you can start small. You can start with, uh, uh, you know, walking before you can run. And uh, a lot of ESG uh, parameters, they they or or indicators, they were there long before the term ESG was coined. For example, uh, employee health and safety, right? Uh, maternity leaves. A lot of it is is uh, regulated. Uh, a lot of it is uh, expected. Um, and uh, I, I feel like we need to change the perspective a little bit uh, from seeing ESG as this, you know, demystify ESG. If, if I if I may say so for for small and medium companies it's it's really it's not that difficult yeah all right I think that's uh, that's something uh, you know to bring home today it's not that difficult and uh, Alan do you have any do you have any thoughts around this uh, you know in terms of like uh, maybe maybe with the experience with uh, with you know smaller companies uh, sure so I've recently joined. Um, quite a big company and they're quite mature. We are quite mature in uh, uh, complying with various ESG ratings. Um, and But I would say that within our team, and it's something that I am quite aligned with as well, is that um, we would much rather focus on strategies that are relevant to us rather than to chase the ratings and the scores. If we are doing the right thing, the ratings will follow. But that said, ratings are still very important because they're sort of like a first line for investors and business partners, if they just want to know a little bit. And um, I also think that for companies that are not as ready, they may not know what, what they're not doing. They might know, not know the expectations of the different stakeholders. Um, completing ratings or questionnaires is actually quite a helpful way to see how you're doing against your peers, to uh, learn about new topics that are coming up, and to look for improvement areas. I actually find it quite helpful. And again, it's really useful for me at a personal level, like if I'm looking for an investment or I'm interested in a company and they have some ratings uh, information, I find that to be very helpful. Um, so I can just do an initial screening. Great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, maybe uh, I wanted to, you know, as an impact practitioner more than an ESG practitioner, I, I like to, uh, to challenge the ESG views a little bit uh, because I believe that impact investing does a, does a little stuff for, Further than uh, than ESG, and actually, I mean, I was reading a great a, a great piece lately on uh, on Bloomberg um, uh, that was talking about the ESG mirage in the sense that companies are 
or investors are actually convinced that ratings, uh, you know, measure how a com- how good a company is, but it's actually the other way around. Is they measure the potential impact that the world and uh, and that uh, you know uh, society has on the company's bottom line, and it's not how the company impacts the world. So um, I was actually wondering whether you um, you share this view and. Uh, you know, also in the light of all the kind of ESG whistleblowers that we have seen lately, you know, like Terry Fancy or or uh, uh, Desiree Fixler from uh, WS, whether you share this uh, this view on ESG or or you believe is uh, is you know uh, going a bit too far. Maybe Victoria first. Yeah, Francesca, this is a very interesting question, uh, kind of throwing us back to the concept of double materiality, right? So on one hand, uh, what is the impact of your business on the environment? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, uh, the you know potential challenges around the environment, what, what financial impact can those have on the performance of your business? Um, I would say that uh, there's, you know, there's a whole universe of ESG sustainability ratings. So, you know, I, I, there's no blanket statement I can give for for all of these ratings. I think that it's an extremely useful tool for uh, for investors. Be that even, you know, even an individual investor. Like, for example, if I am uh, investing, I want to know that the company will be is is doing something to address the risks. Of the of the warming planet on the performance of this business, right? So I want to see that they are thinking about it, that this is integrated in the business strategy, and then I would be selecting appropriate ratings to to um, yeah to integrate in my decision making process. Great, thanks. Um, Kilim, do you have anything to add to? Sure. To I mean, I tend to take a more common sense approach. I I think that um, sometimes we make it quite complicated. We put a lot of frameworks and and fancy terminology. And it's actually quite similar to the the industry I I come from, like real estate investment. We come up with a lot of acronyms and fancy metrics. And it's getting very similar, I feel like, in the sustainability space. And the reason I like working in real estate is actually something we can all relate to. We all live in a building of some sort, and it's quite a necessity. And so sometimes with with ESG, I think we need to take a common sense approach. Even if the rating is very high and the company has spent a lot of resources, you know, for fulfilling with lots of different criteria, I think it's important to take a step back just to think what is the core business of this this company you're looking at, if they're doing something that fundamentally doesn't sit right with you and you don't think it's the right thing or the right thing that they're doing to uh, make money in the first place, then it doesn't matter what their ESG rating is. And I actually think that's why a lot of ESG ratings are now being criticized because sometimes even companies that seem to be doing um, not so um, sustainable things have very high ratings. Yeah, definitely. I think, sorry, go ahead. A very quick point, very quick point to, to add to that. Um, there was a lot of uh, controversies not so long ago when a, when a company in the tobacco industry was included in, in an ESG rating, right? And this is, um, while I, I appreciate and I understand both views on it, right? Both sides. So people who are, who are saying that like this should not be happening, right? Like ESG is supposed to be uh, companies that are doing good stuff. But at the same time, I do see how it makes sense uh, if this company, they're pivoting, right? They are adapting to survive in the changing uh, business environment, right? In the changing world. So it is a signal to the investors. It, is, it does also make sense. So I think we shouldn't be confusing, uh, you know, like just, just broader, that there should be this element of education, capability building that ESG does not, it does not, uh, you know, synonymous with uh, a good company. This is not the, uh, yeah, you know, the uh, B Corp uh, or, you know, like an echo label. It's a tool used for from by investors to assess companies. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great, great example. I think there's also one, also some good examples from the from the uh, energy industry where some fossil fuel companies have actually changed, maybe pivoting from uh, fossil fuel based um, technologies to investing in renewables. And just tracking their journey is actually very, very interesting. And, and you know, they can be turning from 
quote unquote, a bad company to actually a very sustainable and forward looking one. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and I agree that in the end, it's kind of a, um, if, you, if you think of ESG, you should, you should use it as a, probably like a benchmarking uh, mechanism against your peers to see how you're doing. But as, as Victoria mentioned, it's not really a synonymous of, uh, you know, you're doing well. So I think that's a very important point to, uh, to take home today. And uh, now that we have determined uh, basically what ESG ratings are and what they're not, um, I think it would be interesting, uh, you know, to understand how an organization can properly set up uh, an ESG framework or system, um, you know, to improve their, uh, probably improve their scoring or at least uh, learn how to do better, right, uh, compared to uh, what they're doing now. So for me personally, I think the high level approach in general is really to identify the global challenges that your company is facing, right? And then understand uh, what the risks and opportunities related to these trends or challenges are, and then you know try to um, put in place policies within the company uh, that make sure that you can actually mitigate risks uh, and uh, take take advantage of opportunities within your organization. Um, so basically, the question would be how how do you plan uh, an ESG information system? Uh, that allows you to kind of improve your ESG rating. Um, so maybe Victoria, if you if you can take a stab at this, and then uh, we can go to, to Caleb as well. Yes, I feel like this is a very interesting question, very broad. I can I can talk about this for you know for the next hour, but to kind of <laughs> to to make it concise. Um, there is, and I'll start from, from afar, there is uh, research, there's academic research that shows that companies that align their uh, business purpose, uh, that align their business model with the purpose, they perform better. So one of the ways to get started is, is to sit down and, and, and think, you know, what is important for us uh, as a company? What, where do we want to move the needle in the in the community in the ecosystem right uh, for, um, for it, it you know it, it really varies on the industries for example there are uh, there's so many companies that are doing great things you know I'm not going to go into examples I'm not <laughs> here to promote anyone but there's so many encouraging developments that companies that are really they're they're giving themselves this uh, um, mission they have a mission, they have a purpose, and, and that is great. At the same time, as Francesco said, mentioned, um, there are risks associated with the climate change, right? And if you don't address those, you are, uh, you know, uh, at, a ha at a danger of uh, not being competitive in a couple of years or uh, missing out, not surviving in, in this uh, new environment. So at the same time, you, you definitely companies should do this exercise of identifying the risks associated with the uh, physical hazards of the climate change and the transition risks. So what will happen in this world that is changing so fast, right? With all these new policies, with the um, new new rules of the game. Um, yeah. So. To, to sum, summarize, right, like the three things. So one is see if you can align your business model with the, with the purpose, be that an environmental or social purpose and identify the risks and identify the opportunities. How can you gain from, from, from this new environment? Great, thanks so much. Uh, I think these are uh, really key points, to be honest, in, uh, in, in this, uh, like with regards to this aspect. Uh, Kaelin, do you have any Anything, anything additional? I think uh, I think Victoria was very comprehensive. But. Sure, I'll, I'll just touch on a slightly different part of this question, which is the information itself. I think this, um, you know, joining a corporate and working on sustainability um, is hugely challenging. Um, I think when I was in a more numerical space and it was about tracking money and rents and uh, occupancy, this was already quite difficult. Um, but actually trying to track sustainability metrics is much harder because they're much broader and there are probably hundreds of metrics that we're trying to track down uh, on an ongoing basis and from many, many different sources from internal, from external. It's hugely challenging and I think this is a challenge for all companies and uh, we are all working on trying to improve that. But at the same time, getting the information is very important. 
may not just to communicate to other people, but in terms of monitoring our own progress and identifying our own areas for improvement. Great, thanks so much. Um, I wanted maybe to uh, take a quick pause here and see uh, whether there's questions from the audience that we can address, uh, maybe a couple of questions. So there is the first one on, uh, it seems to be easier to quantify the impact for funding uh, regarding carbon reduction, but more challenging for social projects. Um, any, any advice for how to do so? Um, Victoria, I, I have the feeling that you have a very strong uh, <laughs> view on this one so i'll um, start with you yeah thank you francesca for you know putting me on the spot and <laughs> in fact in fact <laughs> not really this is you know this is an excellent question this is definitely a challenge uh well there are very you know well-established metrics such as um gender uh, you know uh, ratio so it depends it depends on the project right so you you have a um you need to find the KPIs that are right for, for what you're trying to achieve. What kind of social impact, right? Is it displaced communities? Then you set KPIs around that. Is it something to uh, empower women, achieve gender equality? You set the KPIs around that. And it's definitely challenging. There's also, you know, these KPIs, they vary across geographies. So something that is right for uh, the US Right, it, it won't be right in, in, in Vietnam or in mainland China, in, in different regions of mainland China, right? Like they, they, there are nuances, there are cultural contexts that you need to consider while setting the social uh, metrics for success. This is, you know, this is, this is a, a question that doesn't have an answer, but fortunately there's a lot of thought leadership. There's a lot of thinking that's happening in the kind of ecosystem around that. So, um, yeah, uh, excellent resources. I'm happy, like, if, you, if, if the person who asked this question, I'm happy to connect kind of outside and then and, and send over some of the reports that I read just recently. Very, you know, great, great work. People are thinking more about the S in the ESG, and that's very exciting. And I think one of the, one of the problems that come with the social aspects of, the, of ESG is also, you know, along, along the value chain of a company, I think it's, uh, I think it's a bit more straightforward uh, maybe not very straightforward, but more straightforward to uh, look at carbon emissions and you know waste and water, et cetera. But like taking into consideration the the social aspects uh, of the companies that a, an organization deals with, I think it's quite uh, quite complex. I don't know if you um, if you agree, maybe uh, Kalem, or if you have a different point of view on this. No, I totally agree. I think it's very hard, and for let's say for sustainable finance. Um, we see that it's becoming more popular, but most of the metrics are in the E area, maybe a little bit in the governance area, but mostly in the E area, just because it's the most uh, measurable and the most comparable between companies. For social issues, I think different companies, I mean, there are sort of the vanilla ones, like for example, uh, diversity, gender equality, et cetera. But I think also a lot of companies have some, some very specific issues that are related to their own company that they could work on that are actually very meaningful. But sometimes because it doesn't generate sort of a large number, let's say number of people lives affected or a large dollar amount, but rather it's a lot of people and working with it, um, then sometimes they're not really so, so visible and so valued or, or difficult to communicate. So I think this is definitely um, difficult and it would be great if there was more standardization or, or more recommendations that Victoria mentioned to help companies that are interested in working in this area. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, the, the the very strong focus that we have on climate now because of the you know the the, the climate crisis that we're experiencing experiencing at the moment, I think uh, it also puts some uh, you know some stress, obviously, on uh, on the aspect of uh, of climate and uh, emission reductions for sure. So uh, it's obvious that they they get a bit more spotlight uh, than other issues, but I think we're getting there slowly. We see more and more you know attention to diversity and inclusion and gender you know gender focus so i think uh, i think we're going the the right way um there was a second question on uh, uh, carbon offsetting actually that was interesting um, um someone wants to know our thoughts on on carbon offsetting and uh, basically purchasing renewable energy certificates um what what i can say is that uh, in uh to be honest, th there is a lot of interest for uh, uh, for carbon offsetting uh, from uh, from investors in the region. Um, 
it can be a very powerful solution, but at the same time, there is uh, maybe unintended consequences that can come with that, and also like uh, strong limitations. For example, the, the the land that is actually available for uh, for that, it's it's quite restricted. Um, and you know, it, th these are projects that take a long time usually to um, to put in place. So um, I think from my side, uh, this will be the, the the key points that I see at the moment. But for sure, there is strong interest in the region. Um, uh, Kilan, do you know, like in terms of, uh, for example, in real estate, uh, if this if this is a, I guess, a strong topic, right? Um, yes, it's a strong topic in real estate as well as in all business. I think, um, mm -hmm. for example, um, at the company that I work in, we've set a net zero goal for now for just scope one and scope two for twenty thirty five, which is actually quite ambitious already, okay. and um, but. As we know, what we should be doing is trying to reduce our own footprint first. So we've been doing that, working on energy efficiency measures over the last 10 years, and we're continuing to do that. But we've already reduced about 40%, but actually there's still 60% is still a lot, and we're also growing our portfolio right now. So we anticipate that with some new technology, but also mixed with some uh, acquisitions, uh, there will still be um, there will still be carbon that we are emitting. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at uh, procuring renewable energy. I think most of, uh, for example, most of our properties are in urban areas. So uh, whilst we're installing solar panels, and, and it's quite a lot actually for Hong Kong, it's actually a very small percentage compared to our total usage. Um, in, some, in some geographies, we've been able to secure renewable energy already, uh, for example, a property in London, and we know that uh, renewable energy is also available via power purchase agreements in some parts of China and also uh, Australia. I think in Hong Kong, it's a little bit, a little bit, bit long limited at the moment, but also an option that's becoming available. But even after all of this, it's still possible that we will need to um, be purchasing some offsets because, for example, um, uh, further up in our supply chain, um, maybe the cement and the steel, they'll still have a carbon footprint. I mean, we still don't have a clear picture on all of that yet, but we, we anticipate there will be things to offset. Uh, we are already looking into the various options. And, and I do hear you that there's not enough land for just um, for just for offsetting everything. So we are really counting on all businesses to be like reducing as much as they can within their own business first. Yeah, I'll agree. Uh, Victoria, anything to add on this one? Um, I think that, I think Francesca, you, yourself and uh, Caleb, you really, you sort of covered it. Um, I would, all I can add is that uh, carbon offsets, uh, no matter what you do, this should not be, you know, a permission, a mandate to emit. So this is not, uh, you know, this is not like, oh, you can uh, buy this carbon offsets and then continue business um, as usual, emitting as much as you have been. So what Calum actually voiced out is, is excellent, that you need to really drive your uh, footprint down first and then compensate offset for those uh, hard to abate uh, uh, emissions. Um, there's a lot of controversy, controversy around it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, conversation difficulty around verifying this carbon credits, making sure they're not double counted. It's, um, yeah. The hot topic that, that I've been reading about lately is uh, not, not so hot, but carbon removals, right? So how can we, uh, instead of offsetting, remove carbon from the environment? And this is, um, I'm hoping that there will be more uh, research and, and investment into this area so that we have a sound kind of technological solution to, to actually suck the carbon out of the uh, atmosphere. Let's see what happens. Maybe just to add to this, I think we're seeing more and more um, nature-based solutions in the in the region uh, that are not necessarily, uh, you know, carbon capture, but like really trying to, uh, you know, preserve um, natural capital in the region. Uh, so there is more and more companies and funds uh, focusing on this because, uh, you know, capital preservation, uh, ca natural capital preservation, and uh, and uh, protection are are very important topics. Um, uh, in, in Asia um, specifically, um, because like the livelihood of so many uh, so many people in the region uh, depend on this, and also um, you know like uh, I think the majority of the species uh, in terms of plants and animals are also um, in Asia. Uh, like if, if we're talking globally, 
So I think these uh, nature-based solutions are getting more and more uh, um, relevant and looked at by investors here. Um, maybe I would take an, uh, one more question uh, before continuing our conversation. Uh, this, this question is like uh, on proprietary uh, ESG frameworks versus uh, maybe aligning to standards like SASB or, or uh, uh, PRI, I think you meant GRI probably. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to hear maybe uh, Victoria's uh, opinion on this. Um, I think from, from my side, uh, we're seeing, um, you know, uh, companies like small companies, ventures, or or funds coming up with, where, with their um, ESG frameworks um, and uh, and reporting frameworks, and I think uh, sometimes there is the um, you know the willingness to o overdo it or the you know like um, they're going down the rabbit hole and uh, overdoing it uh, on this side, um, while there is uh, you know available available standards that they can uh, they, they can already use. Um, on the other hand, we see some investors that, you know, don't want a company to spend time on developing such, uh, such tools. So I would be actually interested to hear your, uh, uh, your experience with this. Uh, could I possibly throw it over to Caleb first, sure. <laughs> just to hear, you know, like an experience of, um, you know, are you guys, you know, you want to come up with, a, have you come up with a proprietary ESG framework? What would be the use case for that? I think for us, we try to report according to the standard frameworks. Of course, we will uh, tailor it to uh, talk about our material topics and our approach. So um, some of the things might be outside of SASB, outside of GRI, maybe it's not following uh, PRI as well. But um, we would make we would try to communicate that way. I was also wondering if maybe the question meant the proprietary ESG frameworks that some of the investors are now uh, having. So, for example, yeah. instead of looking at our MSCI score or other scores that is quite widely uh, known, uh, they are coming up with their own questions and their own criteria, and they're sending to us a complicated questionnaire that we have to fill in, and then we are sort of fielding these questions questionnaires left and right. Um, I think for companies, um, it, it's quite difficult to uh, to fill out all of these questionnaires. Just just um, trying to keep up with the public ones is already quite difficult. But I do think that if um, investors, whether they're companies or individuals, they have their own set of standards and values. Maybe they uh, they think social is more important. I think fair enough. They should make their own adjustments and gather their own data. Um, but I, I do, I do on behalf of companies, I do, I do want to say that it's, it's becoming quite difficult for everyone to keep up. I would echo what Caleb just said, and this is exactly what I would have said, right? But it's um, the questionnaire fatigue, the ESG rating, you know, ESG framework fatigue is real. A lot of companies that would need to hire uh, a whole department, you know, or like at least one person to just to, to just fill in those questionnaires kind of full time. And a lot of times these questionnaires are very repetitive, right? Like they cover exact same issues. So then it's just not very efficient. Um, and, the, you know, I'm, 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 I would, I'm really curious to understand about this question. Um, why? What would, uh, you know, there's no question, uh, there's no answer kind of yes or no. It's more um, what is the purpose? For example, if you're trying to evaluate your uh, uh, investee companies or if you're suppliers, then, you know, then perhaps it would be better to send uh, to use a, a framework or an ESG rating that is already established, you know, that, that, that your um, responders, they might already have that score. It would be cheaper. It would be, you know, faster. Um, yeah. But Having said that, if if you are in a very in some specific business or if you have a, a specific uh, purpose, um, Kayla mentioned social, right? And and there is no kind of robust enough framework for what you are trying to achieve. Then you know by all means, then it's definitely worth it to to create something. And if you have the resources to create something, then then it's wonderful. It it just means that you know we're we're going to hopefully achieve a better result in the end. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think uh, we can move on to the second part of our discussion and then uh, take some more questions at the end if we have time. Um, since we talked a, a bit more about like the framework of, uh, of ESG until now, um, I would like to actually go into uh, more specifically uh, investing, um, ESG investing. And um, I think it would be interesting to understand, you know, how to um, 
you know, uh, ESG investing and how to analyze the, uh, the non-financial tools and metrics in, in an investment. Um, I think, um, you know, essentially, uh, ESG is an investment approach, in my opinion. Uh, um, investors, investors can use it to, uh, to allocate capital and they have several different options to, uh, to actually do this. They can go, they can go for uh, the exclusion approach. They can go through the integration approach um using best in class or thematic etc um uh, but i i would like to hear uh maybe from kaylin first uh you know what you think about yeah the, the uh, esg way of investing and uh yeah if you have any you know recommendation on how to go about it uh yeah i can maybe offer a sort of personal perspective and more more professional one as well um, I think ESG investing in simple terms is just to consider ESG factors when making investment decisions. So I think um, this needs to apply at different scales. If let's say you're a personal investor and you're just starting out, you want to put some money into your retirement fund, I think you should just integrate ESG like you would consider other things. For example, if you are an investor that likes to take a, a negative screening or exclusion approach, like uh, Francesco mentioned, like for example, I won't invest in companies that do X or do Y. That's already an ESG approach if, if the matter you're talking about is ESG related. Or you might be uh, looking more specifically for sectors or companies that resonate with you. For example, let's say you're interested in renewable energy or you're interested in companies that um, promote diversity. Maybe these are companies that you're interested in. And I think for a personal investor, this approach might work. There are also um, a lot of tools that we can use. For example, there are now um, mutual funds and even now ETFs that are specifically in the ESG space. And these have been sort of professionally vetted and they have a certain investment criteria. So it's, it's actually good to use those as well. And, but I, I always use the common sense check um, because then I open up the, the sort of document that describes this fund or ETF. And I kind of look at the top holdings. If the top holdings don't make sense to me relative to what they say is, then, then it's a no for me. Um, for uh, more professional investors, um, probably my experience is more on the private equity side, more or direct investment side. I think uh, integrating ESG should be in the normal investment process. So at the initial start, um, it should be um, included in the investment criteria. Uh, maybe this is negative or maybe it's positive screening. I think both are fine as long as they're in the criteria. And then when considering the investment, this should factor into due diligence, whether it's uh, technical due diligence or due diligence that goes beyond that. And then this information should be presented to the investment committee and should be considered as part of the investment process. And then as all investments go, there will be a business plan and investment plan. So if there are any ESG improvements or, or maybe ESG maintenance, this should be clearly stated. And then we should be monitoring these and monitoring our progress against these targets um, during the course of the investment. So that's sort of my take on it. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with the with the common sense approach. When you when you look at, for example, funds, uh, ETFs, or index funds, uh, you know you look at the at the top holdings, and then you see whether they make sense or not. Because many times they don't actually. So, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's great. Um, thanks a lot also for sharing a bit about the the investment process. I think it's very interesting to um, you know to understand that this is this is something like this is an approach that I guess all businesses, in my opinion, should uh, should implement because. Uh, to me, this is the way forward, and I believe that it, it's something that you need to monitor over time. So identify specific KPIs that you want to improve uh, in relation to ESG, and then uh, you know uh, track them and monitor them um, over time. Uh, Victoria, anything to add on this? Uh, yeah, I feel I feel it wouldn't be very you know, prudent of me to add to the experts in the field to someone who's actually working with sustainable. Um, finance, but to me, you know, ESG investment at this point in time, it's a smart uh, investment. So I, uh, but at the same time, you know, it should not be confused with impact investing. So if you're investing in the company, uh, looking at their ESG ratings, if you're um, driven by the ESG rating, so 
it's not the same as 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 driving the sustainability agenda, right? Like uh, investing in a company that is really um, leaving a positive impact on on the world. Not necessarily. It's just you are mitigating your uh, risks uh, that arise from ESG factors. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, it, it's still very valuable, I think. And um, in terms of like, uh, you know, the, the return on investments and, uh, you know, like the, the additional safety that you can get from ESG investing over the long run, um, uh, compared, you know, like to traditional investments. Um, I think this is, a, this is a very hot topic, has been a very hot topic for, uh, for many years. And I think, um, you know, if you, if you check Morningstar, for example, they have a lot of studies that show that over the past, you know, three to five years, if you look at index funds that are focused on ESG strategies, they actually have outperformed uh, the S&P consistently. Um, so, Caleb, do you think this is just because, um, you know, they have better risk management? Uh, you know, they look at the various aspects uh, related to the climate, to society, um, et cetera, and they put in place better, you know, better mechanisms to mitigate risks? Or do you think it's, mainly because, you know, they pick, uh, you know, the best in class um, stocks or companies um, or, or they integrate uh, ESG into their investment strategy. Uh, what do you think is the major component, let's say, to, uh, to better returns and, and, uh, uh, over the long run? Um, I think it's a bit of both. So I do think the companies that are working more on sustainability, generally, they're spending more time thinking about their overall business strategy and their business management, and also their risk management, and also a lot about how they explore future opportunities as well. So I do think there's an element of this, and we would like this to be the main element. Um, and I think looking forward, we also see a lot of regulations that are coming up that Victoria mentioned at the beginning. So these are all coming up. There are things, deadlines coming up in 23, 25, et cetera, and et cetera. And I think um, companies that are sort of poised to be uh, early movers or preparing for these, rather than trying to catch up to the regulation, will do better. Um, on the other side, I think from the demand perspective, the demand for ESG or responsible investment, impact investing, et cetera, is on the rise. And um, from the demand side, this will also drive uh, valuations as well. Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, Victoria, do you want to add something? Yes. <laughs> uh, very quickly, I read a very interesting uh, uh, case study recently on um, uh, British Petroleum was performing very poorly mm -hmm. on Bloomberg DNI index, diversity and inclusion. Basically, they had very few women um, on the board of uh, directors and, and the company was not doing very well financially. And then they, um, so they put a lot of emphasis on, on really boosting their uh, uh, DNI strategy, their DNI practices. And in a very short period of time, they really, um, they, they did a, 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 you know, holistic transformation and the company very interestingly, um, so the company was not, did not only uh, go up in their performance of, on the Bloomberg DNI index, but at the same time, the financial performance of the company really turned around, really improved. And this is just one of the examples how ESG, right? Like this is the social component, diversity and inclusion in ESG, how uh, this aspect can really drive, improve the company's performance uh, because uh, diverse groups, they make better decisions. They, they have this diversity of, of thought. Um, and uh, I do believe that this is why ESG um, investment, they, they, they do tend to perform, we see that they perform better, right? So um, I, I, I thought that this, this, this was a, a very interesting example how ESG works in practice. Thanks so much for sharing. I think many people need to see, you know, case studies like this to really understand how, how this works in practice, because sometimes it sounds very, you know, uh, very up in the air, uh, not very concrete. So I think I think this is a great way to uh, to actually learn about this. Um, I think we're unfortunately uh, running out of time. 
um, I just wanted to remind the uh, the audience that they can actually, since we didn't uh, manage to answer all the questions, they can actually reach out to us. Um, uh, I guess they have our LinkedIn and uh, or email address, and uh, we will answer the questions uh, over email later um, later on. Um, Eichel, I can pass it back to you. Or Kalen, did you want to add something? I, I wanted to share that I saw there was a question about getting into the industry and yeah. I actually shared an article, useful article yesterday about um, the very broad range of skills that are needed in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a great time and there's no particular skill you need or don't need. So I, I welcome you to have a look at that article. I shared it on LinkedIn. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Thanks so much, Kaylin. Yeah, I think there is more and more, um, you know, resources and more and more, uh, you know, questions around like the skills that you need to to actually uh, break into ESG or impact investing. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for sharing that uh, that article. I think uh, I think there, there is a lot of need for for this kind of resources. Um, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for for uh, you know the attendance, everybody. Thanks a lot to um, Kalen and Victoria for uh, the excellent questions to our ESG questions, and I pass it back to Eichel now. Yeah, so thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you, Francesco, Kalen, and Victoria. It was really, really um, insightful, and um, of course, we wish we had more time, uh, but I know that most most of the participants, including all of us, were working from home. Um, and there are more things uh, to do also to, you know, that's also probably like part of like, you know, the balance. Um, so we will absolutely, so we will be sharing in the follow-up email uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, um, you know, some of the uh, takeaways because of course there was so much. And uh, again, like, thank you everyone for spending your evening with us for asking really interesting and challenging questions. Um, we will be also sharing the contacts of um, all our speakers and uh, please feel free to also ask, uh, you know, and um, let us know also in the um, feedback form that we will share if you'd like to see more events like that so that we know uh, what would be the next one and um, what's coming next. So uh, next Thursday on 7th of April, we are having um, a very special workshop. It's called Unbox Your Circular thinking with James Bishop. So it will be a one hour and a half uh, highly interactive um, creative workshop. So um, please sign up. You will also receive the link. And then uh, there will be a few more um, Leadership Under Fire with Dr. Belisa Vranic. So her first time um, speaking to Asian uh, to the audience in Asia. Um, you will receive it all. Um, and again, yes, I, I see that, um, you know, more um, uh, messages are, are coming up. Um, please have a have a wonderful evening, everyone. Stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and I hope to see you soon at um, W Lab when it once restrictions are lifted and we can do we can host more in person events. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.